perfect. And we are go. Good morning, uh, good evening, and uh, good uh, afternoon for everybody. Um, I'm very glad, you know, today to welcome uh, one very business woman. She is uh, not only a scientist, but she is a, a very uh, acute businesswoman. And she's the well. She's the chief scientist officer from Marinomed, a very interesting company that we try, you know, to decipher during you know, this interview today. Um, Eva, we start during the 15, first 15 minutes. We present you a few slides to explain what is Marinomed and what she is doing and what is the purpose of the company. And then after we're gonna have the uh, interview where we're gonna dig um, a, a few aspects of her, the company and the products. And at the end, the 15 last minute, we're gonna take uh, all the questions that you may send me during you know, the, the first part of this interview. So welcome Eva. Um, we're gonna jump immediately into your presentation and we will come back to you after you know the few slides. So I'm going to load the presentation. And whenever you want me to go to the next slide, you just ask me. OK. The floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you very much, Pierre, for giving me the opportunity to present Marina Mate to your uh, friends and colleagues and your audience. Um, so thanks again for, for inviting me. Uh, please go to the next slide. So I thought I'd start with a uh, short summary about Marina Med, what are we doing, who we are, uh, where we started and what we are concentrating on. So Marina Med is a company focusing on novel therapies for the indications respiratory diseases, but also uh, immunological diseases. And um, these therapies are thought to really make a difference for the patients in the point that they have certain advantages and address medical needs. So uh, we have been founded in 2006. We were four uh, persons for the founding of the company, and uh, it was a veterinarian. Uh, he gave us access to lab space uh, to some extent. We had a marine biologist um, on, uh, with us, uh, my husband, who is a virologist, and myself. Uh, before we founded the company, um, we were thinking about different projects uh, which we would like to include into the company. And from the very beginning on, we thought about marine-derived uh, uh, polysaccharides or polymers that we thought at this point in time could be reasonably used as a causative treatment for viral diseases. So this uh, project now accompanies us since the last 15 years and we very much uh, know now the molecules uh, that we have been working with. Uh, it's mainly carrageenans but not, not exclusively and uh, this uh, platform, the Caragulose platform, which is a particular um, polymer from the red seaweed, uh, has uh, been a very, very good choice at the beginning. And you can see uh, on the time schedule that, again, as mentioned, we founded ourselves in 2006. We had several financing rounds and in 2019, beginning of 2019, we made an IPO at the Vienna Stock Exchange. Uh, we also secured financing from the European uh, Investment Bank. And this helps us also to further develop our projects. On the right-hand part of the slide, you can see the two platforms that we are following. Today, I will focus on Caregalos, which is the first causative therapy for common cold and flu-like diseases. And I will also shortly come to SARS-CoV-2 because during this pandemic, everybody's interested, is there a chance of a new additional treatment. Uh, besides Caregalos, and I'll just briefly touch this today, is Marinosolf. Marinosolf is a technology that has been invented later. It was close to 2015. And it uh, is a technology that allows the dissolution of very hydrophobic so, uh, compounds that don't like water. And we can use that technology to 
make novel formulations based on um, ingredients coming from plants in this case uh, to have a locally acting therapy which is very well tolerated with a high uh, amount of uh, drug going into the tissue where it should go. Uh, below the two uh, platforms, you can see the team. It's not Marina Made, it's not me alone. It's a full team, obviously. Currently, we are 45 people. Here you can see the, the board uh, with Pascal Schmidt as the CFO, Andreas, my husband, as the CEO. Renat uh, is responsible for business development, and Helmut Baranowski is uh, working in operations. So all of them, uh, all of us basically um, are trying to get the company forward. We do our best to do so. And with us, are, as mentioned, another 40 people working on these two platforms. Uh, so basically, Marina Med is, as you can see, a rather small company still. Could you get one back, Pia? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so it's a rather small company, so we focus very much on generating IP and then we exploit this IP, if it's patents or whatever, uh, to generate products uh, which are in the medical field. And uh, basically uh, these products then are partnered and distributed uh, with pharmaceutical companies. And uh, on, the other, on the one hand, on the other hand, we also have partners who are producing our products. Now, next slide, please. So I thought I'd start with a very brief introduction about respiratory viruses, even though now at the moment uh, many people know very much about respiratory viruses, particularly SARS-CoV-2. Uh, but uh, this slide was generated, I think, probably 10 years ago when people were not so much aware of uh, respiratory viruses. So this group of viruses uh, contains at least 200 different pathogens that can infect the respiratory tract. And then upon infection, they induce illnesses such as the common cold, they can make sore throat, they can uh, be influenza or COVID-19 now, and uh, it also may affect premature infants in case of respiratory syncytial virus. So all of these uh, diseases, which are on the left-hand side, are directly associated with the virus. On the other hand, you have indirect effects of viral uh, infections, and these mainly affect subjects that already have a kind of uh, predisposition for a respiratory disease. So this means if you are an allergic person suffering either from allergic rhinitis or from asthma, you have a very uh, high likelihood that this underlying disease gets worse if you have a viral infection. The same is true in, for patients suffering from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which uh, is really, really a deadly disease in many cases. And whenever you have a viral infection, it may worsen the COPD. And finally, and this is rather a very small indication, but still very important, if you are in the position to have a lung transplantation, a viral infection may lead to the rejection of the organ, and then you are really, really in big trouble. So we think that prevention and therapy of respiratory viruses is really a key for improving the life of many, many people. It's one of the most um, abundant diseases in the world. Everybody from, of us in the adult case gets up to two, three infections a year, not now at the moment because we have all these measurements, but usually in a normal year, it's two to three infections a year and children may suffer from up to 15 infections in the season. Next slide, please. As I said in the very short introductory slide, we have worked with carigalose, which is a particular subunit of carrageenan since the beginning of our company. So carigalose or ioptocarrageenan is a very interesting compound uh, as it is broadly active against a wide variety of respiratory viruses. And on the other hand, it's a very safe compound. So if you look at the left-hand side, there's a picture which we have taken in Bali, in Indonesia, ourselves on the, on the, on the beach. Um, and this is a typical red seaweed uh, where carrageenan comes from. Um, it's a sulfated polymer, so it has sulfate groups in certain spaces. Uh, from each other, so in certain distances. 
And upon a secondary structure, this uh, negative charge is important for the activity of the, of the polymer. In the middle, you can see the structure of the polymer, a subunit structure. And what is important here is that caregalose has grass status. This is important for product development, but also for the therapy itself, because a common cold or flu-like disease is, in usual years is not a deadly disease. So it's a self-limiting disease and you do not tolerate side effects. So it was very important that we have a very safe product on the one hand and a broadly active antiviral product on the other hand. Because again, in normal years, you do not know which virus will in, uh, induce the symptoms that you that you are feeling. You don't know if it's a rhinovirus, if it's a coronavirus, if it's a influenza virus, or if it's a uh, parainfluenza virus. And there are many more of those. So this was uh, an important step to show that we have a broadly active and safe um, technology that targets a wide variety of uh, such viruses. Next slide, please. So very briefly on the mode of action of this polymer. I mentioned that there are more than 200 different respiratory viruses. And Andreas, my husband, who is the virologist, he always says, well, they are so different like an ant and a giraffe. Because not only in size, but also on the surface, the receptors, everything is different. So how can it work that you have a broadly active product? Well, uh, these respiratory viruses have something in common. They need to attach to the mucosa in the respiratory tract to be in the position to infect a cell in the mucosa. If they can't attach, they can't infect. So uh, they have something in common, and what they do have in common is a positively charged surface. And this is the reason why this negatively charged polymer with the certain distances in the negative groups is able to wrap the virus, which is shown at the bottom as this blue little, little particle here. And as soon as this particle gets into contact with caregalose, it's wrapped like a vertical wool. So basically the surface of the virus is covered by the polymer, which is like a long wool, and thereby it changes the charge on the surface and the virus cannot interact anymore with the mucosa or also with the cell uh, receptors. So this really is a blocking step for the virus. And if a virus cannot infect, it also cannot multiply. So you can stop the multiplication of virus. This is, I think, perfectly understand if you think about prophylaxis, because then you have this layer after you have used a nasal spray in your nasal cavity and the virus cannot enter anymore. But what about therapy? Because most people do not know when they get an infection. So in case of therapy, the virus needs to leave the cell again as soon as it's, it's ready. And in this very moment, when the cell is distracted by the virus and releases the viruses into the surface, again, the carrageenan can trap it. So it's not only prophylaxis, but it's also a therapy against viruses. Next slide, please. So this is a summary of what uh, data we have generated in the last 15 years in different type of assays. So the most easy ones obviously are in vitro assays where you test the efficacy of, uh, uh, of certain polymers and we always have controlled polymers and different or other sulfated polymers in our assays. But the simplest one is to do a cell uh, type, cell culture assay where you on purpose infect cells and uh, upon this infection, cells are killed and you can make a so-called TCID50 assay. On the, in this table, you can see on the left-hand part uh, the types of viruses that we have uh, tested. Uh, and the, the marks give you the indication where we have done in vitro data. The in vivo data, we concentrate on influenza viruses. This is mainly due to the fact that nearly all of these respiratory viruses have a certain species specificity. So many of them only can infect humans, but not other animals. The exception here is influenza A. Influenza is a uh, virus that infects broadly mammals, but also um, birds. And this one is a perfect vehicle or a perfect target for generating in vivo data. And finally, in the right-hand part of this uh, table, you can see with which viruses we have generated clinical data. And I will come back to clinical data later on, but you can see that 
many of these viruses we have also seen in clinical trials and uh, we have, could show efficacy against those viruses as well. Next slide, please. So, as mentioned, coming back to clinical data, um, we have uh, done in total four different uh, placebo-controlled double-blind uh, clinical trials in natural settings with subjects suffering from common cold uh, or flu-like diseases. So this means that all of these subjects already were symptomatic when they were enrolled into the trial. In total, we had more than 600 patients in these trials, uh, and uh, we also had a children's trial, which was pretty challenging because the average age of these children was four years. Uh, the product that we have used was a 1.2 milligram per milliliter caregulose containing nasal spray in a saline solution. And this product was applied for three times daily in comparison to a placebo saline nasal spray. Um, from the mode of action, the most interesting uh, endpoint was if we could show a reduction of viral load so that our concept that the polymer really reduces the pathogen in the nasal cavity is correct. And we could show in a very nice uh, setting that uh, the, um, in placebo control patients, the clearing of the virus is much delayed, whereas in the variant treated patients, we had a very nice uh, reduction of uh, viral load. Um, in addition, viral load is one hand, and the p-value was uh, very, very nice with 0.009. Uh, but on the other hand, patients don't care about viral load. They would like to know if the symptoms go away. And if you look at the symptoms, we could show that we can reduce the symptoms with a p-value of 0.046, which is still significant compared to placebo. We did not observe treatment-related serious side effects or uh, any withdrawals, and uh, this also underlines the safety of the product. Um, what you can see at the bottom in this bar graph, you can see a subgroup analysis where we could show that the three major groups of viruses that we have seen in clinical trials, namely renoviruses, coronaviruses, and flu viruses, um, have been analyzed separately to see if we have an effect on one virus type or on all of them. And uh, what you can see here is uh, the uh, percentage of uh, patients that had uh, experienced a relapse during the observation period. The red bars are the, uh, the, the, the placebos and the blue bars are the carrageenan treated or the caragulose treated subjects. And as you can see in all of these groups, independent if it's flu, corona, or renovirus, we have very nice effects on these relapses. If you look at duration of disease, and this is on the right-hand part, we can show that we have a reduction of duration of disease. Depending on the virus, it's a little bit different. So for renoviruses, we were close to two days. In, for coronas and for flu, it was more than three days. So the coronaviruses were very sensitive to the treatment. So these, all these data, and this is just a snapshot, show that we could clinically translate our in vitro and also in vivo data and really can uh, offer a positive treatment for respiratory virus, virus diseases. Next slide, please. So based on these data, we developed different products. Uh, they are listed here in the version they are sold in Austria, but I'll come back to other examples in the next slide. So the first one was uh, the, the product that has been used in the clinical trial. It's termed Coldomars Pro for prophylaxis at this point in time. And you can see the different types of products that we have. So we have nasal sprays, we have a children nasal spray developed, we have lozenges containing the same ingredient, we have a throat spray, and the last product was a decongestant combination spray. So some people tend to have a congested nose uh, when they have a common cold. And for those, this particular product is interesting because it's a combination of a uh, medical device being decongestant based on high osmolality. And on the other hand, it also gives you the virus protection. So coming back, going further from Austria, this was our home market, obviously. And next slide, please. We uh, were looking for distributors uh, in different hemispheres and territories, and you can hear, see, here see a selection 
of different countries, different products, all being uh, based on our IP. And uh, below you can see that we have 13 partners that are distributing our products as pharmaceutical companies to the consumers in more than 40 countries. So it's um, a very, but it's important to understand here that it's the first broad spectrum antiviral treatment for such diseases and that we also could extend these data to SARS-CoV-2 probably is also very important. So in the meantime, we could uh, show that SARS-CoV-2 as a coronavirus type uh, virus is similarly sensitive to Caragalose as the old well-known coronaviruses that we have seen in clinical trials. And currently there are several clinical trials ongoing to test also uh, the efficacy of the product against this particular virus. I think I'm at the end of my presentation and this is the final slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Eva. Uh, just for our audience, don't uh, worry. We're going to post that, you know, online afterwards. And um, Eva, congratulations for this presentation. Everything was so simple. So I have, you know, the feeling that I could be a virologist listening to you. <laughs> I think uh, everybody has the feeling at the moment, doesn't it? <laughs> so all right. we all get yeah. special. <laughs> yeah. So Eva, um, we started immediately presenting Marinomed, but... Uh, you're sitting today on the hot seat and would like you know, to know better who you are. So why don't you tell our audience who you are, what is your background, and, and, uh, and, and see what, is, what was you know, the driver of your first idea. So basically, um, I come from a family who's very much interested in natural sciences. So it was a kind of natural way to decide uh, to study biology in the first place. Uh, although I also had some, some other things in mind, but finally it was uh, biology with a particular focus on genetics. Um, so I started this study and, uh, and for me it was at the beginning not so much of interest because it really was dealing with plants and animals and things like that. And I was much more interested in genetics. So anyway, I survived this entering period of the studies and uh, then came to my home ground, which is molecular biology and immunology and I had a very good training uh, besides my studies because I started working in a laboratory when I was 21 uh, in a pharmaceutical company in Vienna. So I was there as a visiting um, student uh, for two days a week, uh, which really helped a lot to get the experience which is lab work compared to just studying the theory. Uh, from there, um, I did a diploma thesis and a, uh, and a thesis as well uh, on uh, allergy. I was working on signal transduction in allergically stimulated mast cells, which is this nasty little cell that makes all the symptoms if you have uh, a type 1 allergy like hay fever. And so I can explain you in detail what's really going on in, within the cells uh, when they are triggered. So after that, I spent uh, still some time with this pharmaceutical company. It was Sandoz in the first place, which then switched to Novartis. And they had a quite nice research institute in Vienna. And I was still working on allergy, but also on assay development. I did some screenings. We had uh, compounds that should have been developed and so on and so forth. So I spent in total like 12 years with Novartis. Then I had a very short... Um, um, well, let's say it was a very short period where I was uh, going into marketing. Uh, I was working for uh, the company Wyeth. Uh, they had Enbrel, uh, the TNF alpha blocker in their, in their portfolio. But the problem was that the production was so difficult that they couldn't uh, produce enough to serve the patients. So I was a product manager without having something to sell, which is a bit of, uh, um, yeah, it's boring to some extent at least, if you can't do anything. Uh, so I went back to uh, a um, startup company at the Veterinary University focusing on a cancer therapy. They had some, some crazy ideas and it was fun working there. And so this was the last station before I, together with Andreas, uh, decided to follow in the so uh, when we prepared you know, the interview, I, I was really, uh, well, surprised by uh, the Heidi that led you know, to the creation of Marinomed. 
can we come back to this because i think it's a it's a good case you know to explain and to and to advertise you know to our audience uh, can you tell us you know the story and how you came up to the idea that marie nomad and the product that you want to develop was you know really what the focus of what you had in mind and how you get to this point you got to this point <laughs> yeah very very likely uh, very much so basically what we have done the principal decision was that we wanted to work together in a company so he is a scientist i was a scientist so we said well let's combine forces and let's do something together and then we sat together and we're thinking about which projects should we target and which projects do we feel comfortable and think they might be successful and what we did we had a, a list of like 15 projects that we were thinking of being interesting and then we made a kind of grid where we had um, evaluators where we said well is it close to market do we have a chance for intellectual property is it in our field of expertise what's the time to market what's the potential um, uh, revenues of the, such a product and things like that and the most important point was the fun factor so this the fun factor had the most heavy weight in this uh, evaluation because if it doesn't make fun uh, the project will not fly so we did all these evaluations on the Clifton projects more or less intuitively and then Caracolis turned out to be the first uh, in the script and uh, so this was the reason why we started with it and we still and we still use this grid if we are talking about new projects and if we always have too many we always have too many ideas what we could do so if we have to select we still use the same grid with, also with our with our employees i like it very much Okay, so let's go back, you know, to the ingredient because uh, seaweed yeah. is all over and everybody wants to use seaweed and there are many, many good expectations and sometimes the people uh, think, you know, it's, it's going to be a, an easy way. So um, in terms of red seaweed, uh, why is it so important, you know, in, in the idea of anti, uh, antiviral? And also I'd like, you know, you to explain what is the process because I think you're not using any kind of seaweed. You need some very high level uh, compounds that are very purified. So can you explain to our audience why the red seaweed and what is the processing of this seaweed before it becomes, you know, your uh, caragulose? So in the process of developing the IP, but also the products, we have tested very many different uh, extracts of seaweed, not only red seaweed but also brown seaweed like the fucoidans and also from uh, from green seaweed so we really really checked a lot of different types of polymers coming from these uh, algae uh, it turned out that even though some uh, of the other ones also had some efficacy like fucoidans have some efficacy against some viruses uh, caragulos are iota caraginan which is the synonym for it uh, is the one of the highest um, efficacy against a broad variety of viruses. So for example, fucoidans work to some extent against influenza, but they don't work so nicely against renoviruses. So you have much more specific specificity in, in those. Whereas the iota caraginan is very, very active against a wide variety of viruses. And there's usually the patient and the physician don't know which virus has induced the symptoms. It needs to be very broadly active. Um, from the quality point of view, uh, as it is a natural product and it's harvested in sea farms all over the, the world, um, it's important to understand, I think, the biology of the plants on the one hand, because they determine which type of caraginin you can extract from them. So it's the plant type, but it's all the season, it's the water temperature, the, the surroundings, which in the end determine the, the mixture of components that you have in your extract. As we are working on therapies, we need to make sure that we have a constant quality in our products and that we can control this quality very nicely. And it's not a problem if it's plant derived or if it's algae derived, but you need to have something in place where you can make sure that the quality is always the same. And for us, it is important that the majority of the polymer that we use is really iota caraginin or caragulose and not some other caraginins because then you have a lack of efficacy on the one hand, if you have too much copper inside, for example. And on the other hand, if you have too much lambda inside, which is also a side product, 
uh, then you have a pro-inflammatory component, which you wouldn't like to have in case of an infection. So we usually have to test the incoming material that comes from uh, big companies if the composition is correct, and then we are only allowed to use it. In addition, we need to pay attention to things like um, uh, metal ions, we need to pay attention to iodine because you always have this fear of uh, customers that you have too much iodine content, that you have formaldehyde inside. So we need to take care of those components as well. But uh, this has been uh, established in the past and this is re really well, well going. Yeah, okay, very interesting. Just a, an additional question about this because we, we, we went through that. But in terms of, uh, I would say, uh, recycling to the aquaculture, growing the algae in, in, in tanks, uh, would it be an option in the future for you to keep you know, the same quality? And, and, and why don't you go, don't you go you know, in that, that, that direction? So. I think as long as we can have the quality from the sea as it is at the moment, and we are very happy, and I think there may be improvements, but we are still very happy with it. Uh, it will just increase the cost of goods if you start to grow the plants in tanks. Uh, we know a company who is doing something like this. They are growing microalgae in tanks in Austria um, for extracting astaxanthine from, from it. Um, and uh, you have to have tanks with light inside. You have to have uh, the culture really well controlled. And I think it's not so much improving the quality compared to the aqua farms, to be honest. So we are very happy with aqua farming. Uh, we don't need 100% pure uh, compound because we are applying it topically. So we spray it into the nose, we put it in our mouth, but we don't put it in our, in our system. So this is probably a difference to people using algae for a different route of application. So we are very much happy with this natural blend uh, if, as long as we can control it. Wow, excellent. Uh, very clear. Um, during the conversation for preparing the interview, we we went through the competition with um, you know um, the vaccines, and and you you have been very uh, upfront and, and straightforward. It's explaining to me that virus you know are spreading very fast, and the vaccine um, I would say campaign are very important. But how do you position yourself with the caragulose, the spray? Are you much more on, on, on an alternative as a therapy? Or what are you looking for in terms of positioning for the product? And even if you went through that you know, this, in the slide, can you explain to the audience why it is so important to have this type of product in the future? First of all, I'm really a fan of vaccines. I think it's, it's important to mention this because uh, uh, it's not that we think that vaccines are obsolete or what, whatsoever. I'm really a fan of vaccines. Uh, however, they have some weaknesses and they have advantages. They are working prophylactically to ensure that you are not as sick as you could get if you don't have the vaccine. But there are certain groups in the population that don't have the option to get vaccinated. Uh, in particular, during this pandemic, it turned out that children below the age of 16 or 18, depending on the vaccine, must not be vaccinated. But still, they should be, have the option to protect themselves. The same is true for immune-compromised patients. Uh, so there is certain groups, which are vulnerable groups, for example, pregnant women, uh, that cannot get a vaccination. This is one point. And you could use the nasal spray to at least uh, reduce the risk to get infected. I think there is more, uh, more reasons why to, this product can be of help. Uh, if you already have the infection, you cannot wait for a vaccination, so then it's too late. Uh, you need to um, treat yourself somehow and the, the, the products would be an option. Third, um, besides SARS-CoV-2, there are numerous other respiratory viruses outside. And you, if, for example, if you have a co-infection with a renovirus, and, and, and the underlying SARS-CoV-2 virus, you can treat with the vaccination the SARS-CoV-2, but you cannot treat the renovirus. So whenever you have a co-infection, we have observed this very, very often. In case of children, more than half of the children had at least a second virus, and one of the children had five different viral strains in parallel. So you cannot treat with a vaccine or with a single 
virus therapy, you need to have this broadly active uh, compound. And, uh, and finally, I think uh, the viruses are going to mutate um, very fast. Uh, it's a really sad story, but they are mutating and some of them tend to be an escape. Uh, so if we need, would like to have something that is universally working, I think the polymers really have a big chance. Excellent. Uh, coming back to the strategy of Marino Med, uh, could you develop, you know, for the audience, uh, what would be the next step development and how do you think um, in terms of um, what is the potential, you know, for, for such a company using the Caragin? Are you sticking you to the algae? Are you envisaging new compounds? What, what will be the type of collaboration you're inviting, you know, uh, uh, you, you are trying to develop? And uh, uh, where do you see Marino Med in five years from now? Uh, well, basically, I think uh, with the Caraginan, we are very, very happy about its activity. So I think uh, any new uh, compound that would uh, boost this activity is highly welcome. We also were playing around in the past, and this has been published with a combination of a pharmaceutical ingredient and Caraginan. So we combined um, uh, an antiviral anti-influenza drug with the Caraginan and could show that we have a synergistic effect. So these type of product would be uh, beneficial probably. Um, so what we are currently more evaluating is other routes of application. So we are currently planning an inhalation study with caragalose, so treating subjects suffering from COVID-19 with an inhalation to see if we have a benefit with, with this. So this is going to be started very closely. And we are also thinking of other routes of application, such for example, caraginan is perfectly working against herpes viruses. So this is one option that we could follow and additional viruses to come. So I think uh, in the end, uh, caragalose will continue to grow in its uh, importance. And we hope that uh, even if the pandemic is, uh, is gone, uh, that people still are aware that viruses is something you need to take care of. And even if it's just the skin or the lips or the herpes, or if it's uh, the lungs or if it's the nasal cavity, what we need to, to take care about not getting infected so much. As mentioned in the beginning, there are some underlying diseases such as asthma or COPD, and I think COPD would be an excellent opportunity uh, to target the, these viruses to lower the burden of those patients suffering from this deadly disease. So I think there are certain growth opportunities with car caragalose. Just one side step, uh, besides caragalose, we are heavily working on Marinosolve, this platform for dissolving hardly soluble compounds. Here we are developing pharmaceuticals um, for different routes of applications. And also this is a very good growth potential for the company. So coming back to what, where we will be in five years, well, we hope we are steadily growing. We are cautious not to grow too fast because this also makes com communication very complicated. Uh, but we have now a new building. We hope to fill this new building with uh, new personnel and new ideas. And uh, so we hope that uh, we will also multiply our market capitalization then. Eva, th this is a very good you know, point uh, because most of the people that are listening to us, they are SMEs. So what convinced you that floating the company was a good idea? And how do you handle this? Because when you become a public company, public listed company, the rules are very different. So the communication, the, mm -hmm. the, the sharing, the partnership. So how do you handle this as an entrepreneur? So, uh, Start with the first part of the question, why we did it in the first place. So basically uh, we had a very uh, diverse investor basis before we did the IPO. So the interests were not in line. And the if it, most efficient way was to go uh, to a stock exchange and be a listed company because then all interests are at the same level. So this was also based on our investor base. Um, secondly, uh, I think it changed a lot on the one hand, but it makes life sometimes also easier because uh, you are restricted in communication. This is true. On the other hand, you have to report anyway, at least quarterly, and all these reports are publicly available. So if somebody would like to know about the finance of MarinoMate, you just go to our webpage, go for investors and read yourself what our company is all about. So it's very transparent and in some cases it really helps. Uh, the rules, yes, we had to, to hire more people in finance and administration. Uh, this is true. Uh, you also have to take care very much about your investors, which is also 
something which Andreas is really good in. So it's his his pet ground or his playground uh, to to talk to investors to to also keep them informed. Uh, so this is really Pascal and Andreas doing this, and I myself concentrate more on the internal, so to say, uh, to concentrate on the science and development. And why on earth Vienna? <laughs> yeah, well, we are Vienna-based, but this is not the only explanation. I think uh, we were thinking of different places, and um, we were thinking of Zurich, we were thinking about Paris, but all, and we never really thought about NASDAQ, to be honest. Um, but we then decided to uh, go to Vienna because we already had a convertible bond in Austria before that, and this convertible bond um, had, had a very broad Austrian-German investor base. And uh, this was one of the reasons to, to keep to Vienna, or to stick to Vienna, because um, we very much had a friendly environment in the stock exchange. They take very much care of us, as we are the only company in the biotech field now, because Valneva has left. And um, the, the rest of the companies in the prime segment, uh, which is the control segment of the stock exchange, uh, is like gasoline company, banks, very cyclic companies. And... We as a biopharmaceutical company are rather acyclic, and this makes it interested, interesting for investors. Of course, we are thinking of broadening our investor base, so we would be happy to also get investors from overseas, from the Anglo-Saxon territory, and we know that we have to invest here also uh, on our PR to get more um, known or better, better known, but we are working on that, and we hope to increase this investor base as well. And I'm pretty sure that the Biomary network will help for that. And uh, you mentioned that you're the only biotech, but you're the only blue biotech in Austria, which is quite, you know, funny. As there well. is one second one, Pierre. There is one, uh, one other uh, blue biotech, and I can introduce you to them as well. In it, Austria? Yes. It was oh, one doing of the our... Microalgae. What? Doing it's the microalgae. No, no, this is also one, but this, this is not really marine. Uh, no, it's Sea Life Pharma. It was the marine biologist that has found it uh, together with us, Marina Med. He left us then later on and founded his own company. And he is uh, Austria, uh, Great Britain based now. Okay. Yeah. But may, well, maybe interesting. Be. Yeah, absolutely. So we know you better. We know better, you know, the company. We will advertise the company around the world. We will help you to get, you know, the right distributors in the US, in China, in Taipan. Well, this is cool. Tell us more about, you know, the team, because you're not only, uh, it's not only you. We know Andreas is the virologist, is the stock exchange guy. But, you know, what is behind Virinomed? Tell me more about the team. I think the team at the moment is uh, still focusing on science and development. So the majority of our employees is working in the labs or in, as a product manager, a project manager, uh, handling different projects. So uh, it's very much science driven, uh, even though, as mentioned before, administration has grown after the listing. So I would guess that two thirds of the employees are approximately related to science and uh, development. Uh, from those, probably I think we are not a typical company, but we have a very high number of female uh, employees, so it's close to 70% or so in all different hierarchies, so this is pretty nice. Um, and um, we have, um, I think, we, as mentioned before, we, we tend to grow sustainably and slowly because otherwise you lose the contact to your employees and you also lose the conversation in the end. So we once had a situation when we were growing too fast and this really is not a nice experience. So we tried to be soft uh, with this. We now, as mentioned, are 45. So my estimation would be we should grow to 80 in the next three to five years. Also to handle the listing better because it's an overload uh, and it's, it's a burden. And if you have more in science and development, you can take this burden more easily. So I think this is the vision that we have to grow. And, um, and if we have 80 per, uh, employees, we would have filled the two buildings that we're having now. And then we would need to think about a third one. So we are thinking of expansion. And so all the, the people, you know, listening to you, well, it's a dream come true, you know, working on seaweed, marine biotech, Austria, well, do they need to speak German to come and visit you and, 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 uh, and, and put an application in? 
No, of course not. Uh, so basically, we are definitely internationally interested in employees. Uh, we have uh, employees from different countries. I have to admit that most of us speak German, but as you can hear, we are also fluent in English, and I think it will also be a good training if also our co-workers and colleagues would have more um, uh, reason or a better reason to speak more English. So it ha everybody's highly welcome. Excellent. So my last question before we take in all the questions that I see on the screen, uh, if I was, you know, this uh, white wizard and uh, I can grant you a wish, what would be the wish, you know, for, for the next, well, what would be your expectation? What do you like? My, my wish, and I think this was always my thinking when I was reading these uh, stories as a child, my wish would be that you have to fulfill all my future wishes as well. So this would be my wish, <laughs> uh, because I never understood why they didn't wish this when I was reading these stories. Uh, so, no, but being not kidding, uh, so I would wish that we uh, can steadily grow, that we uh, can deliver therapies to patients suffering from diseases that now have an unmet medical need, and that by that we can uh, make MarinaMed a sustainable, prosperous uh, company. Excellent. Thank you so much, Eva, you know, for this interview. And uh, I'm going to ask you, uh, you maybe to answer the, the question that we, we have on the, on the board. So Fiona is asking, well, I guess you answered this one, but uh, uh, would Caragulos provide a level of protection uh, from being infected by a respiratory virus? Yes, I think uh, okay. Caragulos is really a nice treatment option. Perfect. Um, Mauro is asking, uh, is there a study about the relationship between structure, position of sulfitation, and chain length with biological activity? Yes, we have done all of those. So if you have the three different commercial available carrageenans, the iota, the cap, and the lambda, they have a different spacing of the sulfate groups. So lambda has three sulfate groups per two sugars, Iota has two and Kappa has one. And um, Iota is the most perfect one. And I talked to a chemist some time ago and they said, well, if you have this helical structure as a secondary structure, the sulfate groups of Iota carrageenan have 120 degrees angle. So you have a perfect um, distance between them. And so this is most likely the, the reason why uh, the sulfate groups of uh, the Iota form are the best ones of it. So the structure is the best one. Uh, concerning chain length, yes, uh, the smaller the molecule gets, the less active it is. Um, so we need a high molecular weight um, compound to be efficacious. So this has been analyzed as well. We made a, on purpose a destruction of the molecule in different chain lengths, and the smaller it gets, the worse it is. And Mauro is also asking, is in very you know, committed to this, but uh, uh, I assume that the proof of concept in animal model has been performed before the clinical trials. Yes, yes. I said yes. so. And you still take this initial approach to check the new polysaccharide with potential therapeutic effects? So basically what we usually do is we have standardized, standardized assays with different respiratory viruses. Uh, this is rhinoviruses, coronaviruses, and flu viruses which we do in vitro in parallel assays, and then we determine the efficacy compared to iota carrageenan. And then we can very easily find out if we have a superiority or not. And uh, in addition, we also do obviously toxicity assays in parallel to see if the molecule has some detrimental effect on the cells. So this is very easily done. If any new marine or plant-derived compound would uh, be worth testing, this can be easily done within a few weeks. Okay. Uh, about the, the ficoidans, uh, well, we all know that, you know, it's a potential inhibitor, um, you know, for SARS-CoV-2. Um, do you have any prospective studies aiming, you know, to, do, to, to study any other type of sulfated polysaccharide from farm marine organisms? I think it's perfectly fine. We are open for any cooperation in this field. Uh, we are interested in this uh, because it also may uh, have impact on IP. So we are always interested in that. Uh, for coins, to come back to that, we have had a very brief look on them. Uh, as mentioned, they are at some viruses very efficacious. 
for others it's less uh, less the case. So we are a little bit hesitant with two coins, uh, even though we have uh, included it in one of our uh, patents. But uh, it's not so easy with the full coins, and they have one more disadvantage, and this is pricing. Pricing for yeah. full coins is much higher compared to red seaweed derived uh, compounds, and you don't imagine, but outside in the pharma industry, it's really all about pricing. And mm -hmm. if you have a too high um, cost of goods price, you won't be successful on the market. Yeah. And I know that, well, we know that we are working on this. So that, that leads me to the next question from Fiona. Where do you source the red seaweed? I, I guess you know, it, it might be too early to answer this question. Maybe we can go back, you know, and in two or three months, you know, tell them. No? What, what, could you repeat the question? Because I'm not sure if I got it right. Where, where, where do you source your uh, red source, seaweed? Uh, well, basically, we have two large companies at the moment uh, that serve us as a, a producer. We uh, I'm not sure that uh, we will keep those two, but uh, maybe other options. But at the moment, we rely on two different sources from big companies. Excellent. Um, I guess we covered pretty much. Oh no, another question from Mauro. Do you perform RNM analysis of your polysaccharide preparation? Is there a preliminary test accessing the biological activity as a quality control? As a quality control for every incoming material, besides those that are mandatory because of the pharmacopoeia, we do an NMR analysis. So we analyze the uh, subtypes of the carrageenans that are within the product and we have a validated method for that that is done externally uh, as a quality control and we determine iota versus kappa versus lambda. We also can determine mu and nu as another forms of, of the carrageenans and we have certain thresholds which must not be uh, um, exaggerated, must not be uh, crossed uh, and these thresholds are that we are not allowed to have lambda inside upon the detection limit, of course, and there is a certain limit for the cap form. Uh, so we do for every batch that we buy, we do this analysis. Yeah. And Kirby is asking, you know, because there are many ways, you know, to, to, to do the extraction for the carrageen. Uh, so he's asking if you do bioactivity assays, yes. And is it expensive? Well, basically, as mentioned, we have uh, outsourced this uh, process to two large companies. Uh, I can name them as DuPont and it's Cargill, the two large players in the seaweed, seaweed field. Um, they do the extraction in a very large scale, uh, but what they do also have, and I think this is important to understand, they have a GMP certificate for medical use. So they need to have certain quality measurements in place to be allowed to sell this product for medical use, and I think uh, this is their major advantage at the moment, but hopefully this changes in the, in the future. I agree. Thank you so much. Uh, we receive lots of compliments. You've been very clear, very, uh, it has been very uh, simple to understand, you know, a complex topic. So thank you very much, you know, Eva, for your clarity, your uh, honesty and, and uh, your direct style. We like it. And we look forward, you know, for the end of COVID using your spray to yes. come and visit you in, in, in Vienna. Yeah, yes. that's for sure. Very much looking forward to. Thank you very much, Pierre. Thank, thank you to all of the audience. Thank you very much. And uh, um, I'd like you to invite you to join us in two weeks from now for the next online event. It's going to be another interesting topic. Thank you very much. And have a good afternoon or a good morning or a good day. Thank you. Thank bye you very bye. much. Bye. Bye bye.